this is Julia now. So you see I'm just loading some packages. I'm defining a variable called size. So you see that size variable, this is in Julia what is called a tuple. So a tuple is something like a vector. It just is immutable. That means you cannot change it once you've defined it. And then it says, I want a data set of 50 by 50 by five by 10. So that, that tells you it's a four dimensional data set with X, Y, 50, five slices, for example, 10 spectral channels. And then I'm, I'm defining variables here that says I want 60 Gaussians to be simulated. And then I'm defining some offset. So that means the position of the Gaussian is just simulated by using the size. So as you see, I just randomize it. So I just make a bunch of 60 random numbers for, for, for four dimensions here. So I make a always four random num numbers and make 60 of them. And I multiply them by the size to make sure that they define any, any position in this range of, of uh, possible pixel positions in X, Y, Z, and spectra. Then I'm defining some sigmas. They also are randomized, but they are of, here they are just, um, uh, in this case, uh, one-dimensional versions. Then I'm just calling this magical function Gaussian, which is actually part of this index fun arrays package that Felix Wexler and I wrote together. And this Gaussian is sort of smart enough to figure out, oh, somebody provides me with a bunch of numbers, I'm interpreting it as simulating a bunch of Gaussians, right? And each of them has its own weight, which is again, random numbers. So 60 numbers for the different brightnesses, and then the different sigma. So what, what do we expect if I now run this bit? So I'm just, uh, you see here is the Julia console. So this is pretty much feeling like MATLAB more or less. Um, if, if, if I do it like this, maybe you can see it nicer. So Julia is starting up and then um, you see it is actually a language that does a lot of um, what you would call on the fly pro, um, compilation. So it compiles stuff and then executes it. And now we have a data set called data. So I can say, for example, size of data. And as expected, it's a 50 by 50 by five by 10 data set. And now comes the magic. I'm starting this viewer. And so I, I've spent well, a couple of days to actually provide an interface to Julia for this viewer so that now it's very easy to start. So officially you would just start it by, by putting, saying something like view 5D and then you would say data and, and all kinds of parameters. But to make it easier, I made what is called macros in Julia and the macros always start with, with this add sign. So then you can just simply write at VV, which means quickly it's just fast to type that's why i did this and um, this means make a new window and, and and start the viewer and nothing else so what what i've done is you're starting the viewer so sometimes at the first time it takes a bit because it first has to to compile everything and and what you see now is the viewer is started um and now i have to bring this <laughs> Ah, uh, here it is, sorry. It's a bit difficult for me to grab it here. So there's the viewer, it's on the different uh, screen and I had to move it over. So I'm just maximizing it here. There's, okay, now the trick is this viewer is operated uh, with hotkeys. So it's, a, it's very much based on hotkeys. However, everything can be accessed with right clicking on a window. So there's, there's basically several right clickable positions. There's one here, one here, of course, and here. There's another one here, which is a different menu and another one here, which is yet a different menu. So you basically have right clickable context menus and um, it depends on the system. There's also a main menu, but uh, that's I think only on a Mac and in the normal uh, systems, the, the main menu is integrated in the top left window here. So you see there's lots of different things that you can do with it, all kinds of menus here, sub menus. And um, all of the things can be accessed via the menus, but there's also hotkeys to them. And I know all the hotkeys, so that's why um, 
it, it might seem a little bit magical when I'm now working with it because I'm typing these hotkeys. So please stop me if you didn't catch what I was doing. So you saw already at the beginning that I initialized the window. So you saw maybe that something looked like this and then I pressed I for initialize. That, that just make, makes the view fit to the screen. Okay, so what do we have now? So this window XY is an XY view of your data and you see nicely these Gaussians. You can also already appreciate some of them are long along Y, some along X and so on. Depends, some are big, some are small. And here, this is, as I update the screen here, this is a 3D data set. So you see this line sort of pulled out as a slice an exact slice from the data and presented here. And this line is pulled out and presented here. And again, this line is then pulled out here. So if I move here up and down by clicking, for example, you see that the focus changes in, in the XY view. So, so now I said, this is a hyperspectral data set. Usually you have maybe just an RGB image or something like this, but now we have a 10 color image simulated. And in fact, the colors are also simulated as Gaussian. You see that if I go here, you see that here you nicely see the Gaussian sort of spectral distribution over this color channel. And what you can also see is that the color channel is in the display currently normalized. So it says intensity as a function of elements normalized. So I call this color more general elements because it can also be used for fluorescence, lifetime decay or whatever you want. So my name for color is elements. And so you see when I move, you see how the color changes, but it's always displayed normalized. Okay, um, can we change this? Yes, we can go in here and we can of course go, go here and uh, say, let me have a look if I find this. Um, I can remove the generalization, but I'm just have to find where. Sometimes it's difficult. Okay, uh, yeah, here it says plotting, normalized plot display, right? So you see that behind it, there's in brackets, the hotkey, which is N that I have to press. So if I go here on the menu, now you see that the normalization is gone and you see how now the display, when I move the mouse sort of updates also the brightness, otherwise it was always normalized. Okay, and I can of course go here and go back, press N and now it's normalized again and the brightness, which sometimes feels odd, I'm going to here and you see no change in spectrum, but that's because we are still sort of on the same influence area of this Gaussian, only when we go to another one suddenly changes. Okay, well, now the question, this viewer is really not about image processing, it's about image inspection and a little bit of interaction with it. So let, let me show you. So the same way that you can click here, you can of course also click in the spectrum. So if I click in a different spectral position here, I this view update and immediately you see the how does that look like here. So then of course, Typically, you, you're not having, well, typically I'm not having spectra. So this is just sort of a bonus feature. What I typically have is something that I will show now, which looks like this. So these are color maps yeah? and you can interpret the whole data as a bunch of channels that are overlayable with color maps. And that means we can give them colors now. And so I can go here on a color map. So by the way, I press Q for or advancing through different display modes in these in this window here. The same I can do here, for example. So now you can nicely see the spatial distribution here. So this line is now instead of pulled out as a slice, it's plotted. So if I press Q again, I'm going back to the 3D orthogonal uh, slicing mode. So I can go here and I can, of course, say color map, for example, red. And actually it should say red and then in brackets R. So that means if I press R, I can use my cursor keys here to go to the left and to the right. So I can simply stain a couple of them red, and maybe stain a couple of them green and then stain a couple of them blue. So now I've decided this region 
this 2D displayed in red, this in green, and this in blue. And you see now when I'm moving with my cursor keys, and in fact also E and capital E are the two letters that move you back and forth here. So even if I'm here, I can use E and capital E to go to this. So then you see them stained. Of course, what we are interested in is to see them as an overlay stain. So the trick is I have to switch the whole viewer to a different display mode, which is called a multicolor display mode. Um, there's a phone call coming in right now. That's not very useful. Um, so I'm in the, in the multicolor overlay mode. Uh, can I get a feedback? Are you still hearing me? Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. Okay, good. So I do this. I can go right click and say probably, let, let's have a look. I never use this, so I'm... Uh, no, it's not here. So I have to right click here and say display color here and then the first one toggle multicolor overlay right so you see it's a capital c so i can instead of doing what i just did with the menu i can just press capital c and switch between single color and multicolor display you can now nicely see how this multicolor actually um, allows you to to, in, to to see color differences between the different spots right because we selected a bunch of them to be red, others green, and others blue. Okay, so let me switch this one back to the to this, uh, this plot display. Now, let's say we want to compare spectra of different points. So how do we do this? Well, one trick is you can set markers. So I, let me let me do this for now. So I'm, for example, at this position here, and I'm I'm setting a marker, and for this there's a hotkey called M for marker. So if I put M, you will see something funny happens. That marker has automatically moved to a different position. It moved to the center of this peak. That's because this marker, um, setting marker algorithm has some sort of thing um, implemented that it always slides up intensities until it finds a local maximum. Uh, so that makes it easy for you to position the marker not so precisely and it just finds a maximum but maybe you don't want that and so let, let me show you how to turn this feature off so if i um if i if i press n november basic small n it, it comes up with this marker menu uh, and that's that's this one I, I it was just popping up on a different screen so that's why you couldn't see it at first and so you see now here this these are the algorithms i was talking about so use automatic maximum finding i disable that and i also disable the center position um, sub pixel position by center of mass and the tracking direction this is also set up for tracking we can say that it wants to do max or min tracking i want to track along whatever elements or time or something like this it really doesn't matter very much here let me set it to element but we don't need, need to change anything actually we wouldn't need to change anything at all anyway but i just wanted to show you if i turn this off here then now i now the markers don't have this behavior anymore i can let them go anywhere and even as you can see here the sub position so i'm pressing capital A and small a for this zooming. Yeah? With capital A, it zooms in. With small a, it zooms out. Again, you find that under the menus. But you can see now the marker. I can move to any position I like. And what you might have noticed now is interesting because you see now there's another punch, another curve that has appeared here in this, this window. One for the marker and one for the cursor position. Yeah, so I can easily compare, for example, the spectrum, let's go to a blue one, this blue spectrum with, with the marker spectrum here. And I can go and set another marker. Let's say, let's say I want the green one here. So let's set a marker there. I could do that by pressing M again. And you see there's now another marker here. The problem there is that this other marker the markers are organized in marker lists. So basically when I do this, I can, I can have a whole bunch of markers like tracks or something like this. Whether they are displayed with lines or not can be changed. But with capital M, I can actually delete the current marker. And I, can, I can also navigate through the markers, but it's not so important. What I want is really a new marker list 
so if I, for this, it's a small K. If I press a small K, you have a new marker list. And you see now we have already three spectra displayed here. One is the, the first one, like this one. Another one was this one. And when we can even make more spectra, let's go here and make another marker spectrum, maybe to a different slice. So now I'm at a different slicing position and I'm setting another marker with the K. So K starts a new marker list. And you see now that, that we, we, this allows you to compare different spectra in different locations. Um, and I think uh, that is like some of the main features, uh, what, what you've seen, of course, again, we can, can switch off the normalized view any way we like. Um, but now uh, one last thing I wanna show you, which is kind of cool, um, which is if we now want to analyze the data in a different way. So let's, let's say, uh, by the way, these markers can now be exported in various ways. So if I go, for example, here, and I press M, um, well, let's look here, and I, sorry, element window, I press M, get this marker list. These are all the marker positions with the information uh, where they are sitting, and I can copy paste this to Excel. So this is mostly useful for tracking and stuff like this, but I can also export it to Julia and I can import it from Julia if you want specific marker positions or stuff like this. They also have a hierarchical structure to them and and so on and so on. Um, right. So, so what I want to show uh, as a last feature is let me go to this multicolor overlay again. So let's say this is a red channel here, and um, well, this is a green channel. So what I do now is I'm pressing actually Y here, and that moves this HY marker here, and I can go he here and press Z, and it move, moves, it created another marker called HZ. So why is it called HY, HHX, XY, and HZ? So the trick is, if I go to this channel, that's one red channel, that's one particular green channel, and then that's one Z, uh, one, one blue channel, and I can interpret these channels that every pixel has these three colors and they can be interpreted as, as something that you can make a histogram of. And so what I can do now is I can press key H that makes a, a magical little histogram. And if I'm basically now, if I go on a different window, it opened this histogram. And what you see now, it has entered all the pixel coordinates into a 3D histogram. And so you see that now I can navigate again with the same viewer, but with a different data set through the histogram. And of course it's relatively sparse because this, this view doesn't have too many pixels, but it's already interesting. So in histograms, it's, it's, it's usually quite useful to look at projections of them. And, and this viewer supports projections. So I can, I can press capital P, or, uh, capital P or small P. So P is a max projection and capital P is an average projection. And let's let's go for the max projection. So I do this in all the three windows. So now, of course, when I move here, nothing changes in these projections. And what is interesting is because the way it was simulated, you saw some, you see these streaks in the spectra. So what does that mean here? If I go on a pixel here, it means that this combination, for example, here, this combination is, is, well, sorry, uh, I have to find, it's not so easy. Uh, uh, it's, it's probably here. So, um, this is a particular combination of red, green, blue um, combinations of colors. Yeah? So the x-axis is red, the y-axis is green, and the z-axis is blue in this particular case, because that's H, x, x, y, x, x, z. You see this also, it says here frequency counts in the histogram. For example, it's difficult to see because we are, we are in, in the projection mode and so now we see, for example, 4,996 counts have zero and so on. So now what can we do is we can, we can select regions of interest. I pressed capital S to switch to a different ROI mode, which is a, a user selectable region of interest. And let's say we go here and I, I shift click on a particular location and shift clicking starts such a ROI. And then I can, for example, select now a region of interest that cuts out one of these peaks. With a double click, I'm ending the ROI and you, you see now all the projections have updated and you see, aha, uh -huh, okay, this is one of the streaks here and 
I guess that's actually fine. So it's a particular combination of red and green that we have selected that, no, of blue and green that we've selected here. And now I can press H again in the histogram and the interpretation taking a histogram of a histogram is actually opposite, it goes back. And it has inserted now a different view color channel in the original viewer. And you see now that this is binary. So rather than displaying this, we have a binary channel and it marks all the pixels that have this particular combination of RGB. So you see some of the beads actually, well, some of the Gaussians, basically just two of them have been marked in, a, in, in this way. Yeah. So if I go to the multicolor overlay, you will see that this one doesn't appear there. But I can make it appear there. You see it's not, doesn't have this off flag. So if I do this, it can switch it in and off the overlay. And you see these were mostly this, this green bluish beads. Not the totally blue ones and not the totally green ones, just the right combination of green and blue. So you can, you can nicely see how you can interact with it. And you can, of course, then also go and say, ah, I'm more interested in green beads. Let's, let's make a region of interest around a green bead. Let's look how this looks in the histogram. So I press H again. Let's go to the histogram view. And magically, now we have a two color histogram. So you see the green pixels are the second ones that we, we've put in. So that, that is the, this green beads, they look, they, they have this combination, whereas for example, the, the other ones have this combination. So we reset the region of interest so that we see all the pixels. So you see this is total histogram with the green, green ones being the ones that are selected. Uh, you see they have quite, um, well, they have a higher green intensity as, as the others, so I guess in here. They are all most low, mostly on here, so they seem to be very green. And of course, you can go and make a um, make another one. Let's select, um, for example, one that has more blue. So I'm selecting this one, maybe in 3D, more like this. Okay, H, and let's have a look. And there's another channel. So you see that this nice streak here is the right is this blue combination and so on. Okay, so I think that is pretty much um, all I wanted to show about hyperspectral display using this viewer.